I don't know about you, but sometimes when dinner time starts coming around, I start feeling that same familiar dread of, oh no, what am I going to make today? I'm kind of bored of everything I always make and I don't have any ideas of anything else to make. Maybe your kids are such picky eaters or you think they're such picky eaters and you're trying to think what you could make that they're actually going to eat. Maybe you're sick and tired of thinking of ways to make a special meal for each special request of the family. One is a vegetarian, another one doesn't like mushrooms, another is a gluten-free kid, whatever it is, it can get pretty crazy. In this episode, we are going to get really practical to make your cooking life easier and even more fun. We talk about simple hacks to help you take out the overwhelm or even despair at times and dive into ways to make it fun and simple. We also talk about how it's really about way more than just the food. Linda's cooking skills were so bad, her own family banned her from cooking when she was a teen. Happily, her skills have dramatically improved. She now has over a thousand cookbooks, is a graduate of Roxby Cooking School and the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, and has countless cooking courses from the International Culinary Center and Natural Gourmet Institute under her belt. She's a kitchen confidence coach and owner of Balabusta's Secret, where she helps busy moms with meal planning, prep and cooking lessons, as well as coaches them on how to serve dinners with side dishes of games and clever conversations. Whether you're a novice cook or looking to add some oomph to your dinner routine, Linda's all about making ordinary weeknight meals extraordinary with speed, ease, yum, and lots of fun. Hey, and welcome to the new Mama Marriage Bliss Show. I want to help you get out of the overwhelming distance and guide you to reconnect to yourself and to your husband. You know you want things to be different, but you're probably not sure how to make it happen. Well, Mama, you're in the right place. Here we will dive into all the things you need to start loving your life and relationship and start living like soulmates and not roommates anymore. We will dive into motherhood, marriage, communication, holistic inspiration, and practical hacks and tips. Mama, I believe that transformation and deep connection await you. Hi, I'm Aliza Saeed, proud mama and grateful wife, and the Mama Marriage Coach. You too can turn your mess into magic. Come on, mama, and let's do it together. Welcome, Linda, to the podcast. I'm very excited for this conversation because as I shared with you, I'm very much in need for this conversation personally. <laughs> um, so welcome, Linda, to the podcast. Thanks. I'm really thrilled to be here. Tell I'm us, happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> tell us who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is Linda Letterman. I'm the owner of Balabusta's Secret. I like to say it's the keys to living a luscious life. I'm a kitchen confidence coach, and I help busy moms meal plan, meal prep, cook, and then serve dinners with fun and games and laughter at your table. Because to me, mealtime is a holistic whole package, and each of the parts need to be done well. Wow. I want to ask you about every single thing you said there. But hold on. Before you say, before we do that, what is a balabusta? A balabusta, I'm going to translate this very literally because I translate it the way I want it to be. A balabusta is a woman who makes a fine home. And in my fine home, it's the anti Martha Stewart for those who know who Martha Stewart is. It is not a pristine home, it is the home where people want to be. They want to come, they want to put their feet up, they know they're going to have great food, great fun, great conversation, and it exudes with warmth and love um, and friendship. Wow, I love how you say anti-Martha Stewart, because like, we have this picture in our head of like, what we would want our home to be and like, come and help me make that. So I love how you say, don't even aspire to that, because that's fake. Uh, You know, uh, as an aside, Martha Stewart lives a couple of miles away from my house, and I have seen her on more than one occasion. <laughs> and what does her house really look like? I want to know. She's got a massive, massive estate with multiple homes on it, <laughs> multiple greenhouses on it. Uh, she's got peacocks that roam sometime in the streets. Uh, she's got horses. I see her on her horses. She's got she's got quite the place, and it's only one of many homes that she has. Wow. I'm guessing she's not the sole balabusta in her house taking care of it all. I'm guessing she doesn't do any of it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so 
So we're we're not going to take so many tips from her. So let's get back to being a real balabusta. Actually, every time I say that, I hear my bubby, my grandmother in my head, because she used to always say, you're such a good balabusta, if whatever you did, if whatever it was. So this is really great for me. Um, so tell me what the main struggles that you see busy moms have around meals. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you why I got started. I was it kind of leads into that. So when my kids were, were young, you know, they would have their friends over for sleepovers and dinner and all that wonderful stuff. And they'd be at the table and they would say things like, well, my mom doesn't cook like this. And we never have fun at the table like this. Can you teach her how to do it? And it's like, wow, how could you not know how to do this? And how could you not want to do it? And then with the, you know, as they got a little older and they would have after school activities and I'd watch the parents giving their kids a sandwich in the car and calling it dinner. And there's so many reasons why dinner time is important. You know, the studies show that when you sit down for a family meal, your kids do better in school. They have better communication skills, better social skills. They're less likely to abuse um, dangerous substances. And even if the science didn't show all that, why wouldn't you want to create an atmosphere where after a busy day, whether they were at school, whether you were at work, whether you were volunteering, whether you were managing your house, why wouldn't you want to create an atmosphere where everybody could relax and actually be themselves? Because so many times during the day, you have to wear a different face depending on what you're doing. And you want your family to know you, you want to know your family and extrapolate you want the, your friends to know the real you and your family when they come over so to me dinner time is a really essential time and on top of all those reasons if you don't have a really wonderful sit down meal and I'm not talking about elaborate meals but if you don't create that atmosphere your kids aren't going to know how to do it And then they're going to be living on fast foods or crap food, takeout, and they can't replicate all those wonderful values for their families when they have it. So on top of everything else, you're really modeling to your kids a wonderful way of life. So I'm hearing that this is so much more than just food. (laughs) It is so much more than food, yes. It's so much more than just And it kind of brings me to my other grandmother. I have one grandmother who was from Connecticut and like very prim and proper, very, and then the other side is from India. She grew up, she lived in India until most of her life. And for her, food was her way of showing love. And she used to say, so not about the food. She was actually asked a few times to open up an Indian food restaurant and she refused because she said, that's my way of showing love. I don't want to get paid for it. I don't want it to be something that's a business. I just want to show love with it. So I love how you took it completely. Like you didn't even talk about the food there. It's all. And, you know, and, and, and I, I, I um, always say food is love made edible. So I'm very much like your Indian grandmother. Did you always like cooking? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in high school, my mother is a, ter- a terrible cook, was a terrible cook. And when I was in high school, I confronted her and I said, mom, you're cooking just as horrendous. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't a real shy kid. And so she said, OK, big shot, put your money where your mouth is. And she bought me a book called The Joy of Cooking. And she said, one day a week, you're going to be in charge of cooking something. I'll buy the ingredients, you know, give me the recipe in advance and you cook. Well, the pressure was on. What did I know? I did not know how to cook anything because she was a lousy cook. So I figured I had to do something that was going to be impressive. So the first time I made Swedish meatballs, never had Swedish meatballs. This book had no pictures. I didn't even know what they looked like. No clue. Came out awful, just awful. Next week, I decided to make veal cordon bleu. I can't even say it now, (laughs) let alone cook it back then. It was horrible. I literally, literally didn't know what I was doing. The third time I made dinner, it was such a disaster. I got banned from cooking. And they said, you no longer can cook in this house. So a lot of people take that as defeat. I took that as a challenge. And that's what I encourage people who I work with. 
don't take it so personally. It's food. You know, you can rise above this. And I said, game on. And I'm going to show everybody I can learn to cook and be really great at it. And that's what I did. I took cooking classes. I have over a thousand cookbooks now. Not that I follow a recipe because when I teach people how to cook or how to cook better than what they do or differently than how they cook, um, my goal is to teach people the basics and then give you the confidence where you can create everything the way that works for you, the way that works for your family's preferences. And you can look at a recipe, you can look at a cookbook, but you're not a slave to it. And that's where the beauty and the magic comes. Hmm. So maybe that brings us back to the question, what are the biggest struggles that you see with busy moms? Because there's Lack so of knowledge. much in the kitchen. There's yeah. like- a lot of people say, I have no time. Right. And the answer to that is then let me teach you the tricks and the shortcuts. Because, what are the tricks? Share. Well, there's a, a ton of them, <laughs> but um, it doesn't have to be demanding to be delicious, but you have to know what you need to do to get mealtime prepared, planned and done in a realistic time frame. because everybody's lives are busy and it's not like, Maybe your grandparents didn't work. And so your grandmother spent a lot of time in the kitchen and she loved doing it. Um, but the reality of today is I believe that our lives are at a much faster pace. So you need to come up with ways to make that experience the same without putting in all the time. So what are some ways we could do that? Okay. So there's a lot of things. Uh, you can p- you meal plan. So you're not stuck at six o'clock saying, I have no food. I have no idea what to make. And meal planning means different things to different people. And when I do work with my clients, um, we make an individual way for them to meal plan because what works for one is not a one size fit all. You know, some people like to come up with a whole written meal plan on Sundays and they're all set for the week. And that's really great. Doesn't work for me, but I can teach you how to do that. Some people say, okay, you know, I I don't know what I'll make two days a week. That's fine, you know. But what you need to do first before anything is look at your schedule. Know when you're going to be busy. Know when you're going to be late. If you know your kids have an after-school activity that's going to run late or you have to be at the office or at a meeting or at a business, you know, dinner or something – Don't plan on really delving into a new recipe that night for your family because it's going to be a disaster. So know your schedule, know your kid's schedule, know your spouse's schedule, because they all interact. It's not just you. It's, you know, you're working with a family and everybody's got different schedules. So know what your time frame is. Another thing I like to do is tell people to get a list of recipes they're comfortable with. Um, Ideally, we expand on that list as as we work together, because if you made the same three recipes every three days for the rest of your kid's life and your family's life, you'll go nuts. So you need variety in it as well. But you have to start with a couple of recipes you know how to do. Then what I ask, what I suggest to people is don't cook from scratch every night. And if you are planning ahead, you can take a look at the ingredients that you're using and figure out how you can use them in a different way. I call it repurposing on another night. So I'm going to, I'll give you some examples. If you're going to make a roasted chicken, a real simple roasted chicken, make enough so you have leftovers. You can use the leftovers for sandwiches and lunches for your kids. You can repurpose them and season them a little differently and make chicken tacos another night. And you're not cooking those tacos from scratch anymore because your chicken, aside from the seasoning, is already done. So when you're meal planning, you're looking at what are the key ingredients you're using that week and how you maybe can repurpose them. If you're also going to be making a dish that's got sliced onions, like I make a a chicken tiki masala, and you don't have to make the tiki masala sauce from scratch. There's plenty of good brands out there. If you just look at the labels and make sure they're fresh ingredients and, you know, not a lot of sodium and a lot of preservatives in it, you know, they'll, they'll do. So if you're going to be making a chicken tiki masala, maybe you're going to be putting it on rice. So you can make a double batch of rice, and this is called batch cooking. And you're not going to use it all up because you made a double batch. The next night, you can take that leftover rice and make a fried rice. Maybe use the leftover chicken from your roast on it, because the secret to making fried rice is your rice has to be at least a day old. So now you're ahead of the game and half your meal's done. And you could take that already cooked leftover rice, 
toss it with some toasted sesame oil, some soy sauce, some ginger, garlic, maybe some peas, carrots. Sometimes people scramble an egg inside their, their fried rice and add your chicken with it or, you know, leftover meat or tofu. If you had baked tofu or something, um, your dinner's done. And the bulk of it was cooked the night before and it was something else. So those are the kind of tricks and tips that um, I work with people on. And obviously I give them a variety of recipes that they can do for either of those concepts. Another thing you can do is if you're batch cooking, you're making a lot, make a lot and freeze some of it. Not everything freezes well, but, you know, once you learn what freezes well, Freeze a bunch, meatballs. You know, you, I make my kids an Asian spicy meatball and I bake it in the oven because I don't like the splatter and I don't like the mess and it's so much easier. And I make a real big batch. And one night I can serve it over rice noodles with a peanut sauce because rice noodles, all you do is put them in boiling water for a minute and they're done. Peanut sauce takes no effort to make whatsoever. It's a great dinner. You could take the leftover meatballs and you can either put them in sandwiches the next day for lunch or you can break them up and put them in lettuce leaves with a little bit of Husan sauce. Again, you can buy the sauce. And now you have a totally different dinner the next night and serve it with uh, bok choy and ginger, you know, or whatever greens you have laying around. Steamed broccoli with seasonings on it. So again, you're not cooking from scratch every night, but with a little bit of menu planning and menu prep, you're saving yourself a tremendous time. And you've got variety and a lot of flavor in everything you're cooking. Kind of sounds like a game, like, okay, let's see how we spice it up today with the things that we still have from yesterday. Actually, I, I always wanted to meal plan and it never actually happened. And since my baby was born three months ago, we decided that we're like taking this on full force and it's such a game changer. Absolutely. Like, oh my goodness. Last night we were actually sitting with the kids and we asked them, okay, what are we going to make this week? And we like open it up for suggestions and then everybody gets to get the meal that they chose and it changes the whole week. Like just the mind space of not thinking, Oh no, it's dinner again. What are we going to do? It, it really changed so much. So, I, and, and that's actually a great thing to do. And I, it's something I suggest with, um, I suggest it to all families, but particularly with people who have, I call them selective eaters because you don't want to call them picky eaters because then it stays in their mind. Oh, I'm picky. I can say no to everything and you don't want that. But when you have kids, engaged in telling you what meals you know recipes they want to use they have a skin in the game at least that's what we call it around here skin in the game so it's harder for them to say they don't like it you know because that's what they requested and um it's a good way to get everybody to start eating when, when you have challenges and also you could plan around those challenges like i have one child who can refuse most things but she'll always be happy with like a lentil soup. So I'll make the lentil soup in the beginning of the week and in a huge pot. And then it's either there for her or I freeze it if she doesn't want it because she has. And then I could like play around with that as well. So you could like really plan around it. And it really Absolutely. helps. And you can make that, you can thicken up that lentil soup during the week and, you know, make it a uh, vegetarian sloppy joe on rolls for dinner. Um, exactly. You can stuff roasted peppers with it. There's a million things you can do with it um, once you have the body already done. Exactly. Yeah. How about like cooking styles? I find that lately I like know what I usually do and somehow everything just goes back to that. And even if I read recipes and whatever, like, Okay, we're talking about soup. So I find like I usually put the same spices. And even if I have a different recipe, I'll like end up going to kind of the same style food. You know what I mean? Like, how do you? So, so there's different methods and there's different ways to tweak food. Um, if you're comfortable with the ingredients that you use, which is probably why you fall back using the same seasonings and spices, take those same ingredients and think of a different ethnic cuisine. Yeah. And take a minute to see what ingredients are in that ethnic cuisine's repertoire or pantry staples. You know, everybody's got different pantry staples. I have many pantries filled with many staples from around the world because I like to try so many different things. Um, not everybody has the cabinet space and there's ways that you can get around that as well. But you can take, if you know how to make, let's say you know how to make a piece of salmon. And let's say you just broil it because you know in 10 minutes it's going to be done. And give, you give me an idea of what you would put for your seasonings on that. 
So my usual is like the Asian soy, sesame oil, honey, like all that. Okay. Ginger, so instead of, instead of doing that, why don't you make it um, put some sliced oranges in your pan or lemons in your pan and then put the salmon over it? And then you could add um, Mediterranean spices and a little citrus juice or a little orange juice. And you're going to have a very different flavor, but you're going to cook it the way that you're comfortable with. And you're not adding too many different things, but your flavor is going to be totally different. Or you can change the cooking method. If you're used to cooking your salmon um, as you're at, under a broiler or on a grill, maybe you want to bake it. And maybe you want to bake it with a pistachio nut crust. Mm-hmm. And so you're changing both the method and the things you're going to be putting. Or you want to make a pesto sauce, put it on the salmon, then add a, a, a pistachio crust mm-hmm. and bake it. Totally, totally different flavor, totally different way of cooking, still done in 10 minutes. But now you've done something very different with something that you're very familiar with. Right. Do you think that any mother can learn to like cooking? Absolutely. Because you got to get rid of your fear of it. Sometimes the reasons why people don't like it is because they don't have the confidence because they don't think they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Or it seems too overwhelming or it seems too time consuming. But if you start putting on some tunes and you start making it a game for yourself. And instead of feeling threatened when you make something, when you put something on the table, make it a game when you put it on the table. So when I cook something that my kids haven't had before, the first thing I say is, is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? And again, this is part of that getting them invested in the process. So if I get thumbs down, I don't take it as a defeat. I say, okay, well, I'm going to make it again because you're going to make it again. What should I do differently? And then you're getting your kids trained to think about what flavors do they like? What taste do they like? What didn't they like about this way that they would like to change? So now you're getting to be almost budding cooks without them really having to do it. Plus they're analyzing their preferences. So then the next time when you make it, incorporating some of those changes, you can say, well, I took your advice. Let's see how that worked. And so you're never giving up. And you're never defeated because you've changed your attitude and you've changed your mindset. And so you can start celebrating the little wins, you know, and the more you celebrate your little wins, the happier you're going to be about cooking because you're not slamming your head against the wall all the time. You know, when you have a handful of recipes, you can cook. When you have a handful of techniques, you know how to use. When you have things in your pantry that's well stocked, that you know, that, that they become go-to items. So you're not worried about what to do. Or if you know what you can substitute something for, if you're looking at a recipe and maybe you didn't bring the recipe with you when you went shopping and now you find out you're missing two ingredients and, oh, woe is me, this is going to turn out terrible, what do I do? If you learn what substitutions are, then you're not going to get flustered because you have it under control and it's going to add to your joy of making the meal. And then when you throw into the mixture fun and games at the dinner table where everybody enjoys being there. Well, now the pressure's off because you're having a good time no matter how it came out. And now dinner time becomes a really pleasurable experience that everybody wants to look forward to. So tell me a bit about those games at dinner time. Sure. Well, I will tell you that they never stop. So I have a 19 year old son and a 16 year old daughter. We have been playing games since they could play a game. A 19 year old son brought home his girlfriend recently for dinner. And it was the first time we had met her. And I said to her, you know, does, did Max tell you we play games at the dinner table? She said, yes. I said, did he tell you that you're expected to play with us? And she said, yes. And I said, great. So we started playing these games that we play at the dinner table. And it was a fabulous way to be comfortable with someone you didn't really know and to make them feel comfortable with you. And it wasn't, well, what are you studying in school? What do you want to be? What are you going to do as a job for the summer? You know, or, you know, if you have little kids, it's like, what did you do in school today? What did you learn? Nothing, nothing. And you want to shoot yourself because they've been away for eight hours. They had to have learned something. 
and you're getting nothing out of the conversation. But if you're playing a game, um, and there's a million kinds that you can play, and, you know, this tailored for different ages to make it, it easy for everybody to do. Now everybody's laughing, everybody's having fun. And you learn an awful lot about your kids by the responses to the games. Um, and it's a whole different level of communication. You know, and you make it a comfortable place where everybody can share things, both the good and the bad, but it's a place that they want to hang out. My my daughter had a friend come over the other night. Again, we're going to have to play, game, you know, games. And it was a, a male friend. And he was having so much fun at the end of the dinner. My daughter said, okay, let's go. You know, we're going to do whatever we're going to do. He said, no, can we play a little bit more? <laughs> so that's what you want because that's the balabusta part of making a family meal. Can you give us some examples of games? We usually do the same. I actually also grew up in a home where there were games at dinner and usually it was like kind of the same every time a different kind of question that everybody had to answer and sometimes they were more creative sometimes that and we also do it at my house and my kids know that they go and get the spoon that we pass around for the game and I would love to hear some other ideas for what kind of games okay. you play at dinner so time. you have you have younger kids so I'll give you a really good one to play with young kids it, that you can buy it as a box game but you don't have to the box game is called headbands and you don't need to buy it so your job is to take a couple of index cards or construction paper, or you can cut these things out of a magazine if they even have any magazines anymore. Um, but you just need pictures of things that your kids can identify. Somebody is it. They can't look at whatever it is you're going to give them, whatever picture it is, but they have to hold it up on their forehead for everybody else to see. And then they have to ask questions to guess what it is. So let's say it was a picture of an apple. You know, m most kids at most ages can recognize the apple. And so the person who's holding up the piece of paper has to guess. And the questions can be, have I ever seen one before? You know, is it blue? Is it bigger than the house? You know, you know, whatever questions they come up. And it's not only is it fun to see how they have to get to the answer. It teaches them logic. It teaches them deductive reasoning. Um, and, you know, obviously you can help them, but you can only ask yes or no questions. Right. So um, it's a great, great, great game. And you can make them funny pictures, you know, easy to play almost at any age and you know you add new pictures all the time so your game is always fresh and then you rotate who puts the picture up on their head because everybody has to look foolish <laughs> you know it's, right. it's not one person you're singling out and some people will get it really quickly um and others it'll take a long time and it's okay if they give up and then they'll look at the picture and they go oh yeah and then they learn what kind of better questions they could have asked next time so that's a great game for our little kids Another game that you can play with without any cards is a round robin story. And what that is, is somebody starts off, you know, you can make it however you want to start it. But once upon a time, there was a fill in the blank and you give two or three sentences. And then the person next to you adds on to that story. Now they can take that section to any way they want. I mean, you may have think of Prince Charming and they're talking about, you know, going to the movies with a kangaroo, you know, and they'll take the story in that direction. And then they say a couple of sentences, a couple of paragraphs, and then the next person has to add to that complete story. And you can go around the table as many times as you want. And out of the mouth of babes, you get some really creative things. But again, it shows you how they think. Maybe it shows you what they learned in school or what's something that they heard from their friends. But they're clearly expressing things within their repertoire that you're not going to normally get by just asking them how was their day, what was going on in school. And you can end the story whenever you want, laugh and go on to another one or not. But there's many, many games like that that you can play at the table that will um, make it a lot of fun and will make it so that your kids don't just eat and say, I'm out of here. I love it. I'm going to try this week every night to try a different game. Thanks to you. <laughs> well, let, and, let me, and let me know how you like it because not to, not to make a pun, but it is a game changer. You know, it's a, and listen, it's, it's great. Even if you don't have kids and you have a spouse and you run out of things Absolutely. to say at some time, games are a great way to do it. It really, yeah. they really are.
Absolutely. Yeah, we usually do play a game and they wait for it. They'll like ask me, wait, what are we doing today? Because we'll do like that headband game. We'll do a, like personalities that they have to think about of someone and then guess mm-hmm. who it is with yes or no questions. And we we like change it up a little bit, but I don't put enough effort into it, like enough thought. So that will be something that I will intentionally do this week. Thanks to you. And I will let oh, you know. Good. I'll good, tell you. Good. I was actually just talking to my husband yesterday. We have um, some friends that live around us that we were all talking and they were saying how for them, the whole night routine is kind of like, let's do it as fast as we can and get them to sleep as fast as we can because they're like tired from the day and they just want them to be bathed, fed and in their bed so that they could, you know, have their night off. And we were talking about me, my husband, about how they're missing out on so much with their kids because like yep. those moments of sitting around the table and actually talking to them and not just wanting them to, you know, eat what they have on their plate and go to sleep. It's so precious and so much comes up and it's so important. So thank you so much for giving those great ideas. That's awesome. And it makes you, it makes your time worthwhile too. It's not just great enrichment for the kids. It's great enrichment. And um, I can't think of the word, but it, it, it reminds you of why you have a family, yeah. you know, because it's the feeling that you always wanted to have with your family. Yeah. So many times I feel like, especially with young kids, you could get so stuck in the schedule and in the day to day and in the, And sometimes we have to like really force ourselves to go and do something fun with them. And then once you're in the moment, you're like, wow, why don't I do this all the time? Like then you, like you say, (laughs) maybe this is what it was about. (laughs) Absolutely. Today I went to the park with my kids and we had to like walk a little further than where we usually go. And at first it was like, oh, am I really going to take them all out now? We only have a half hour to go and maybe we should just stay home. And when we were there and I was on the swing with them and we were running around the you're like, yeah, of course we should. You know, like you have to force yourself to do it. And then you enjoy every moment. So, Absolutely. yeah. If we go back to meal planning, sure. um, I want to ask you about what do you do when really there are different preferences or different diets in the home? Maybe there's gluten-free. Maybe there's vegetarian. Like I, Like maybe there's all different things going on in the home. How could you make one meal or do you make one meal for everyone? So for a very long time, my son was gluten intolerant and lactose intolerant. Mm. My daughter announced, I hate this gluten-free food. (laughs) (laughs) And I I, I eat differently than my family does. So I was no way in the world going to make three different meals every night. That just, I think you don't teach your kids to expand their palate that way. And there's no reason to have that expense. And there's no reason to have that wear and tear on your san- your sanity and your happiness. So you figure out where you can compromise, and where you can stop a cooking process, put some things aside. Maybe they don't like it as spicy as you like it, um, but you don't want to have bland food for the next 10 years until they catch up to your flavor profiles. But there are some things that you could stop mid cooking process and set aside but you're still cooking the same thing, but you're seasoning it differently. So that's a one way to do it. Um, Sometimes if you're making something um, and your kids don't like the base product, you can change it with sauces. So maybe it's the sauce that you put on it that they don't like. So make them some pieces without the sauce, or maybe you can make a different sauce that maybe everybody would like. Um, you can take out, if you're making a soup that's, if you're making, let's say, a, sea, a seafood stew, and there's somebody who doesn't like one of the ingredients, you can leave that out, maybe substitute something else for it. You're still making your seafood soup, but you're not putting in that one ingredient that's going to set somebody off and say, I don't want any of this. So there are a lot of cooking techniques and tricks that you can do. Um, sometimes it's a textural thing, too, with kids. It's not necessarily a flavor that they don't like, but it's too mushy or it's too hard or it's too, I don't like the shape. I don't like the color. You know, kids can find a million reasons why there's something that they like and that they don't like. So if you can pinpoint what that issue is, you can easily modify it by still making that same dish. Or let's say, let's say your family eats meat and you don't. 
and if you're making a pasta dish with a, a meat sauce. So you're still making the pasta, and then they can have the meat sauce. And you can use, you know, garlic and olive oil and whatever else you want to put on yours. You're not really mm-hmm. cooking those differences. It's still one thing you're making, but you're just seasoning and dressing it differently. Mm-hmm. And you can do that with most food products. Right. Awesome. What's your favorite meal? I'm I'm curious. Whatever I'm cooking at the moment. Oh. <laughs> oh. No, actually, um, I, I don't have a favorite meal because I love so many different cuisines and so many different things. And, you know, over time, you get different associations with food and different memories with food. So, you know, for Mother's Day, I have some memories that, oh, yeah, this is what I love on Mother's Day because it reminds me of fill in the blank. Um, I, I don't have a favorite one because I really I myself and my family really love a variety of cuisines and dishes. And that's what makes it very interesting for us and very flavorful because we're not having the same thing and we're not using the same spices all the time. And so I think it's the creativity that I love and the new flavors to try. It's always nice to bring back, you know, tried and true things that, you know, my my kids have certain go-to things. And then the other day I was making, my, my son was home from college for a spring break. And I said, okay, Max, what do you want me to make? So he said, you know, make me some um, chicken tenders or chicken breast with some kind of crust on it. So I said, fine. So, you know, I, I, that just sounded too boring, <laughs> you know, so, so I couldn't do that. So I marinated the, the chicken um, and you cut it. If you want to cut down on time, cut your chicken breasts, you know, into nice, you know, semi thick pieces, but the thinner you make it, the quicker it's going to cook. So I sliced up a bunch of chicken breasts and I put it in um, an Italian seasoned dressing that I made. That's really good. I threw it in a baggie and I put it in the refrigerator for, however long I had. And then I took out three little bowls. And again, because I'm sensitive that he used to be gluten intolerant, I try to not give him as much gluten as possible, even though he thinks he's cured. Um, <laughs> I had three little, I had three bowls. In one bowl, I had um, tapioca starch. You could use cornstarch. You could use arrowroot. You could use rice flour. I didn't, you could use flour, but like I said, I wanted to avoid flour. Next bowl, I had some eggs. And the next bowl, I had panko, which are like a thick um, Japanese breadcrumb. And in each of those bowls, I added seasoning because I add seasoning to everything. I We don't eat bland. So, I, you know, I put seasoning in the eggs. I put seasoning in the, maybe I probably put um, like a Southwestern blend in the flour um, and minced garlic flakes in the eggs, whatever it was. So then I dredged the chicken in the egg. And I, I dredged the chicken in the tapioca starch, the egg, and then the panko. And I put it on a sheet pan. And I baked it for maybe 15 minutes it was done because they weren't thick. And so the outside got really, really crisp because I did it at a high heat. And my kid said, this is the best chicken you've ever made. And I looked at him like, you've got to be kidding me. I've, I've done way better than this, <laughs> you know? And he said, give up your business, mom. Just sell this chicken and learn how to freeze it. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, it was a simple dish, but it was something I had done different. And all of a sudden it became a favorite for the night. So that's kind of what you want. You like that enthusiasm. It's, it's a nice thing to hear. Yeah. What if somebody says, I'm just a bad cook. I don't know how to cook. Where should she start? At the very beginning. Try to figure out what kind of flavors you like. And then if somebody were to say that to me and when they were a a person that I was working with, I said, let's start building some foods that are really basic. That it's going to give you the confidence to know I can do this. And when we start with the I can do's and I like the flavor of it, then we can do some more. And the more we build that repertoire and that confidence base, the more we can branch out into different flavors and different techniques and broaden that repertoire. And then really, it does not take very long to get, for lack of other terms, a book of business or a lot of recipes in your toolbox. And then all of a sudden, as you get more confident, you know how to create things on the fly. So you have to start at the beginning with some really basic recipes, some really basic ingredients. And one of the things that people need to know is 
What are the basic pantry staples I need to have on hand? What are the basic rest of re- refrigerator ingredients I should have on hand? What should I have in my freezer on any given day? And if you have a well-stocked pantry and a well-stocked refrigerator and a well-stocked freezer, the next step is to know what to do with those things. And as you learn to what to do with those things, that's building the foundation to get better and better and better. And they, and when you see how quickly and easily things can be created that both you and your family like, you're not going to hate it so much anymore. And you're going to realize the more you do it and do it in these small steps, the quicker it takes. And now all of a sudden, the way you imagine dinner taking, you know, an hour and a half, two hours after I come home and I'm exhausted and I can't see straight anymore. When you realize that's not your reality, it becomes a good reality for you. I feel like sometimes when I'm looking for inspiration of recipes and videos on YouTube and Pinterest and like, how can you kind of quiet all the noise and like really stay focused and find something and not just get lost in everything that's out there? Sure. Figure out the ingredient you want to use that night and just search that. And it's, and you can pinpoint it down more. You can pinpoint it. Okay. Tonight I want to make Asian chicken. Okay. So now you're, you're narrowing your focus already. Then you might say, Oh, I want to make Asian chicken. And I really like watching film the name of the blank chef. So now you're narrowing the options of what you want to cook and who you want to learn from. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say take two or three recipes and either pick one or combine them all. But you don't have to have, or if you see a lot you like, I have recipe files on my computer. People have them on your phones. So I have a folder called recipes. And within my recipe folder, I have sub sub folders, seafood dishes, salads and dressings, um, poultry dishes, side dishes, um, plant-based dishes, you know, make up your own categories on however you like to cook. And then just copy and paste them or earmark them into those folders So then you don't always have to go down the rabbit hole. You're already building a set of things for you to look at. I have a, there's an app out there and, you know, I don't know if people use cookbooks anymore. I love my cookbooks because they transport me to other places and give me lots of ideas, but there's an app out there called eat your books and there's a free version and the paid version. And I've got the paid version and, Maybe it's 20 some odd bucks a year. I mean, we're talking very, very minor charge. And what you do is you put your cookbooks in by title. And then when you want to look for a recipe, you can say, I want a chicken dish. And it will tell you the page and book of all your books that have chicken recipes. And then you, and and you can see the ingredients and you can say, yeah, I don't want to use that one now. I don't want to use that one now. And it, it, Pinpoints it very, very quickly. Or if you don't want to look by ingredient, you can say, I want to cook Italian. So you can search all your cookbooks by Italian and you'll get those recipes. Or you can say, I want to look at Bobby Flay recipes today. And you get all the Bobby Flay recipes. And, you know, you get the page in your books because obviously there's copyrights for everything. So it helps if you have it. Um, and if you don't have it, you can look in their library for these things and you can see what books do. And then you can go to your library and rent them if you want, if you don't want to buy them. Okay. So it's a great resource to narrow things by ingredient, by cuisine, by author, by book. Because sometimes if you do have, and, and they have magazines on there too. So there's, you know, food and wine, Bon Appetit, you know, gourmet magazine that's not even in business anymore. Plus a, a lot of other magazines now. So it's a great way for you to find something and keep track of it. They also have, they come up with a, um, they have a newsletter when you sign up for them. And every, every week they send you um, the new cookbooks that are coming out. And usually they give you a preview of a couple of the books in that cookbook. So again, it, it, it helps narrow your focus, but it kind of opens up a whole nother way, another world of menu planning. It's a great resource. And is there anything you don't like in the kitchen? I'm interested. Anything I, I don't like um, overly complicated because I really don't think that there's a need for it. I don't like pompous. Um, I think 
it's important to make your presentation look nice, but you can make your presentation look fun um, because, you know, you eat with your eyes. So if you're planning a meal, don't plan on making all brown food or don't plan on making all white food for your meal because it's not going to look good. And it may taste great, but it's going to be um, not as enticing. So um, I like color. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I also like color. My my creative side is in salads. So and my kids know that I need colorful salads and like my daughter will tell me, "Oh, look, you don't have any yellow in this one. Like you need something that's going to pop it." So, yeah, I definitely love adding color and also like just making fun things with the food. Like not playing with your food, but maybe playing with your food a little, you know, like um, if you do an omelet and make it into a face or absolutely. Maybe, yeah. Like play around with it, make it a game. It's, it, you know, it's food, have fun. Yeah, really. Absolutely. If you make it fun, all your hangups about cooking are going to go away because you're laughing to yourself when you're making these little creatures out of, you know, apples and who knows what for their eyeballs and everything else. I mean, you, you can make it really fun. Yeah. They say that the sense of smell is something that we never forget and it can right away bring us back to some place or time that we smell the the same smell. And I feel like cooking really allows us to create those like smells of warmth and of love and connection that whenever your child is going to smell whatever dish it is somewhere else, it's going to bring them back to those warm feelings inside. And it really Absolutely. is. So, yeah, it's so much more than just food. Where can we find you? So I've got a, a bunch of places. I'm, I've got a website, BellaBoostaSecret.com. I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook group called Easy Weeknight Dinners for Busy Moms. Um, and in fact, I, I was supposed to do a, a live demonstration today on how to make a sheep pan dinners. I had done a poll in the group and that was the one that everybody picked and the technology wonked out on me. So I'm doing it tomorrow. So if you sign up for my Facebook group today, you can watch my live demo tomorrow. I have a freebie for your listeners called uh, quick dinner time, sanity saving tips. And it gives you an idea of pantry staples and fridge and freezer staples, uh, quick little tips on meal planning and meal prep and a couple of games and ideas on, on how to have fun at the table. So if you sign up for that, uh, that will put you on my mailing list. So when I offer courses or when I have new announcements to make, you'll always be on the know. Awesome. We will link everything down in the show notes. So it will be easy to find it down there. And before we finish off um, our conversation here, I like to ask sweet and short, short and sweet (laughs) um, questions about motherhood because I love hearing other people and so many different perspectives of motherhood. So if you could tell us what is one of your favorite things about motherhood or being a mother? I love hearing my kids voice and their laughter. Mm. Um, it fills my heart. It fills my house. My son calls me from college um, every night now. I, I've lost my mother recently and I used to call her all the time. And my son has taken upon himself to, to fill that void. And I can't tell you how that makes my heart smile. Um, that's me- m- part of motherhood is how they enrich your life, how they teach you so many things, how when you think you know everything, you realize you know nothing at all. And it's a growing process. And it's a growing process with challenging, but with abundant love. And that fills my heart. What's one of the challenges of motherhood? Same things. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, the challenges are obviously everybody's got their own personality and their own ideas and you have to learn how to be flexible you have to learn how to accept some of those ideas and how to guide other ones and that can be a real challenge sometimes especially in the teenage years I mean every age has a challenge but in the teenage years um, it could be especially trying yeah someone once told me I think when I had my first the bigger they get the bigger their problems get so just wait (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. That's really encouraging. (laughs) 
How about an embarrassing mommy moment? Oh, let's see. There's a million of those. I think my favorite is my daughter has grown drunk t- taller than me. And sometimes she'll look down at me and she'll go, Mom, you got a lot of gray show and time to dye your hair. I was like, oh, gee, thanks. And she's not afraid to say that in front of other people. <laughs> um, one more question. What tip would you give to yourself before becoming a mom? Be true to yourself. You know, you have your own values, your own visions um, of what you want things to be. But you also have to be flexible because now you're dealing with other people's lives and they also have their own ideals and their own visions, even when they're very, very little. And so sometimes it's very difficult to not impose everything that you think on someone else. You have to be willing to listen. And this is true with your spouse or your children, your friends, your coworkers, but you have to be willing to learn And life is a learning process. You never stop learning. And there's a million things to learn, a million things you think you know, and then you realize you don't know anything at all. So be true to yourself, but be open to the universe at the same time. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so, so much for coming on and sharing with us. This was very helpful for me, and I'm sure it will be very helpful for so many others. So thank you so, so much. Is there anything else you want to share before? Um, sure. The the parting words I'd like to give everybody is it's not very difficult to make the extraordinary, the ordinary extraordinary with speed and ease. And you owe it to yourself and you know, to your loved ones and you know, owe it to your friends to make life extraordinary. You know, it doesn't have to be hard, but it makes it that much more beautiful. Beautiful. I don't want to add anything to that. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really had a great time. Hey, Mama, and thanks for joining us and listening to this episode. I know what it's like to crave some together time with your husband, but feel so stuck because for whatever reason, you can't leave the house. Maybe someone's sick. Maybe there's no babysitter budget, or maybe you're just too exhausted. Well, that's why I would love to gift you a list of 50 date night ideas that you can do at home when you can't find a babysitter. It doesn't mean date night is doomed. Go over to alizasaid.com. That's A-L-I-Z-A-S-A-I-D.com slash 50 date night ideas and download a list of awesome ideas for a date night at home. Plus, you get some really essential guidelines to make a home date awesome some important things that can either make it or break it. So head over to alizasaid.com slash 50 date night ideas and date away.